Well, good morning, Lighthouse. So, again, my name is Jeff Vogelzang, and um, this morning, when Pastor Emmanuel asked me to share, I said yes. Like, you go, oh my gosh, what did I just do? But, you know, the Lord is good. He always gives you something. But this morning, uh, as I was seeking the Holy Spirit, he led me to uh, Psalm 105. Um, and if you want to put a title on this message, it's called The Power of His Presence. So we're going to just dig into the Word, and I have a few things that the Holy Spirit has shared. So I just let's read that together. So if, if you want to put up a Psalm 105, that screen. But Psalm 105, if you have your Bibles, um, open up to Psalm 105. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. It says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make his, known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his name, in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments that he has uttered. Let's just take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We worship the name of Jesus. You are the God who was and who is and who is to come. You're the Alpha. You're the Omega. You're the beginning and the end. And as your word says in Revelations 1 verse 8, you are the first and the last. You're the author of all creation. You're the great I am. You're the king of peace. I thank you, Lord, that it says in Isaiah 55, 11, your word goes forth and it performs that for which it is sent. It will not return to you void. Father, I, I boldly come before your throne of grace and I ask that you divinely collapse the power structures of the wicked that lead astray your precious sons and daughters. I ask right now that supernatural interruptions are mandated against all forms of wickedness being planned right now from the kingdom of darkness. I declare that the assignments against my lives of my brothers and sisters right now in Christ Jesus come under the jurisdiction of heaven. They become forcefully canceled in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your heavenly angels right now are presently ministering protection to me and to every one of my brothers and sisters here at Lighthouse that angelic guards are fighting our battles as we declare your words over our lives. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for your profound love for us, for this lost and dying world that goes beyond all comprehension. I pray and ask that you would give me and all of us here, Lord, the grace to be an instrument of communication on your behalf because your word says in Proverbs 11.30, he who wins souls is wise. I declare that the sum total of everything that you've put under our stewardship right now in this moment is coming under the protection of the blood of Jesus, extends to all of our relationships and upcoming divine appointments. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the grace that you give us each day, that your grace sufficiently empowers us to overcome every obstacle that is in our path. I pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. The title, like I said, in Psalm 105, in Psalm 105, King David thoroughly shows us how to enjoy the Lord. So in the first five verses of this psalm, he gives us ten commands or ten things he wants us to turn our attention to, that would turn our hearts to the Lord. We give thanks, we call on his name, we make him known, we sing to him, we tell of his acts, we glory in him, we rejoice, we seek, look to his strength, we seek him always. We remember his uh, miracles, wonders, and judgments. But as I was reading the psalm this week, as the Holy Spirit will always do, he kind of like jumps something off the page. So when you're, when, you're, when you're reading your word and you're spending your time with Jesus and you read something and it goes like, boop, it pops off the page, it was in verse four, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. That's the verse that jumped. And I want us to spend just a few moments digging down to show you how the Lord what he kind of shared here. So there are three ideas. There are three ideas in this passage that I just want to just kind of quickly expand upon. One is seeking him diligently, seeking God's presence, and doing so continually. So I'm kind of like a, I've got sort of a teaching gift. I just want to take a moment and lay what's called the foundation so we understand when, because words mean things. So you hear teachers and 
preachers give certain things. So there are two words that came that I looked up that express this um, idea of seeking, seeking the Lord diligently, okay? That's the first point we're going to look at. There are two words that I want to share. The first one is called darash, all right? In simple layman's terms, it's that you seek something with intention and diligence. It's like you care about something so much, you're going to seek after it. And what really in modern terms what that looks like, it's spending time with someone or it's getting to know them. You know, a classic case of this, or a really good teaching example, is when in the, in, in the Gospels, in the, in the Gospel of John, I didn't write down the actual chapter, but when Mary and Martha, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? She was sitting at his feet. She was listening to what Jesus wanted to share. He was, she was desiring, she was intent on listening to him. It's that idea of just being intentional about sitting with someone or getting to know them. So the second word that, that I want to just lay a foundation on is called bakash. It's calling, it's like you seek to find or you look for an object. It's like you, you, you lost something and you're trying to find it. You look for them diligently, right? I remember when we went to Walt Disney World many years ago, I don't know how long ago it was, Trisha, we went, and as a, as, a, as a father, I was responsible for my youngest son, Ben, right? And we were standing at this one, it was, we were at MGM Theater, I think, and MGM Disney, and, and we were looking at the, that was when Narnia came out. And we were standing there, and we were just so mesmerized by what was going on, and I look around, and we were just like looking at everything, and next thing I look down, he's gone. Now, for anyone here that has had, or you've lost, maybe some of here, maybe I'm probably the only one that's lost a, a child like that, you know that immediate fear that goes through you? You're like, oh. Oh my gosh, what, what? And there was this thing, but then you just like go, oh, I've got to find him. And so for the next 15, I think it's about 15 minutes, we were like, where are you? Well, thankfully, you know, so there was this intention of like, I have got to find, there was this urgency inside of me. You need to find that because I love my son. We love someone. So it's like we, that intentional thing of, and for the next 15 minutes was like, where is he? And then we, thankfully, there was a worker that, you know, just saw him and just came alongside of him. And then we eventually were able to notify everybody. We found him. But there's like this, and then when you find him, you got this relief. But there's this like, oh, like, I just want to be with you. It's that kind of a thing. That's the kind of diligence that the Lord shows. And three examples of this, we talk about that word. There's three examples that Jesus gives, basically. And if you want to put up that one right there, there's three examples. They're all in Luke 15. This is the same kind of diligence the Lord says, hey, this is what I want. This is how I seek you. This is how I seek my people. The, uh, Luke 15, 1, the lost son. The parable of the lost coin, the woman that lost her coin. She searched and searched and searched until she found that coin. And the last one is the lost son, and the other one is the lost sheep. Sorry, but I got those mixed up. But it's this issue of this is what the Lord, in terms of seeking, he seeks us with his passion. That's what he's, that's what he's encouraging, he's inviting us to is to seek him with that kind of diligence. So the second idea that I want to share is that we want to dig down on is the, seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. It's the object of seeking the Lord or seeking his, um, his presence. There are three objects given in the verse, Psalm 105, verse 4, it's where it talks about seeking the Lord, his strength. It's... There are three objects. Basically, the, the first one is the Lord himself, his strength, and his presence. So the first thing I want to just throw out there for us to consider is, the first thing the Lord wants us to do is he wants to seek him. Are we content to, to just seek him? Do we want him and him alone? We all have needs in life, and I'm not saying we shouldn't seek him for those things, but he wants us to come to him. Is he the object of who we're seeking? You know, so often we rely on our own strength. We rely on our own, you know, ability. But he wants us to just seek him. In that same one, he talks us to seek, he talks us to seek his presence. You know, the Hebrew word, so I'm going to do one more word here, just to dig down on a word. The word presence, it's called paneum, right there. And what paneum, essentially, it's translated two ways. There's two, two words that are used often. One is presence. Okay, that means the physical presence or the, the manifest presence of God. The other one is face. Now, I could relate to the term face because have you ever been out with someone, had a meal with them, and you really enjoy spending time with them? 
Well, that's the, what, the, what the writer, what, the, what, the, what David is saying here. He wants to seek his face. Both renderings are correct. But I understand the term face because it's, it's, it's basically something you can relate to. You can see it. Like you're walking down the street. You smile at a stranger or they smile at you. you there's a smile. There's, like, there's this presence that you, are, you can relate to. And so to the Hebrews, you know, because the, the, the Psalms were written from a Hebrew, Hebraic perspective, you know, that was, it was written from David because he was a Hebrew. They understood this issue of the face. So there's two ways that they looked at it. One was a negative way. When the, there's many places in Scripture where it says the Lord, if he was displeased with someone, this is the Old Testament, if he was displeased, he would hide his face. That was like absolute horror if the Lord were to hide his face. So they're, they're always wanting to, it showed favor. The, the, to, to seek one's face means to, to seek favor. The way it's positively portrayed, we say this blessing a lot. You know, if you look on the wall out here at Lighthouse, it's the ironic blessing. It's to seek one's face positively means um, it's, the, it's the ironic blessing in, in uh, Numbers 4, 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And lift to, the Lord may the Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you his peace. So it's a positive thing is when, we, when that's prayed, when the Hebrews understood, they understood that. They got it. It's like, oh, this is this Lord's favor. You know, the one thing about the expression face to face, it, it denotes personal contact. It denotes a, a level of intimacy. Some examples in the Old Testament, how the Hebrews, this was taught, was Jacob. Remember Jacob when he wrestled with the Lord? That when, I think it's in Genesis. He wrestled with him face to face, and then the Lord blessed him. The Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. So there's this concept that the Hebrews understood that it meant favor, it meant a personal connection to God. So the, the one I want to drill down on here is, the, is this issue of intimacy. So it's, the face of God essentially intimate, int, indicates intimate presence. So when you read Psalm 105.4 to seek his presence or his face, it's an invitation from our Heavenly Father, from Jesus and the Holy Spirit to intimacy. Now, can I just take a pause here for a moment and speak to you, to us guys? You know, it's this, I've had this over the years. This has been a wrestling match for me when it comes to this word intimacy. You know, because it's just, oh, it's like I've got to deal with my feelings. I've got to express feelings. And that's all part of it. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But Honestly, guys, what I've learned in my journey as I've walked this out, this the word of intimacy, you know, my wife shared this one time with me. It's like the word intimacy can break down to into me you see. The Lord sees right into us. He knows us. He knows us, each one of us personally, right? But what I, what I take it to me is this. God just simply wants to have a connection with you. He wants to just simply, to just you to come to him as you are. No, no, no pretending. He just simply wants us to come and be with him and connect with him. So the cool thing about all of this, what I just laid out, now we get to make a transition. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, that, there, there was a way that the Hebraic people related to God. It was, there was a prescribed way, and for good reason. God laid it out in the law and all of the Old Testament. But then when Jesus came on the scene, right, and he went to the cross, and he died, and he rose again, there was a significant shift that took place on how we can approach God because there was a specific way before. Now there's a new way, right? So when Jesus was on the cross, Matthew 27 says, when he died, the veil on that temple, in the, in the temple, was torn from the top to the bottom. Now let's just take a moment and think about that because if you understand the context of this, that, that, that curtain which separated the holiest place where God's presence was, where he was, his literal Shekinah glory was, was 60 some odd feet high and it was like 30 feet wide and it was almost four inches thick. Now I'm a farm boy and I relate things to when I look at it because I grew up raising cows and milking cows and raising crops in southern Minnesota. We had two silos on our farm. They were just over, just about 70 feet tall. And I, went, I would climb up that thing every fall and I would sit there and go, Oh my gosh, that curtain was like 10 feet from the top of one of our tallest silos. It was 30 feet wide. The width of those silos weren't even that wide. They were, and it was that high, and it was thick. 
And the reason that that thing was rent from the top to the bottom was why we know only God could literally do it. They said that they took horses back in the day when they would put that thing up in the temple. They would try to pull it. The horses couldn't even rip it. It was so, so strong and so taut that only God could rip it. So when Jesus died, the first thing it says that happened is that veil was rent from top to the bottom. What's that telling us? God said, I'm making a new way now for me to come into my presence. So 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says this, and this is the glorious thing, and we're going to kind of land and come in here. It says, in 2 Corinthians 4 6, it says, For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, he is shown now into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, the glory of God resided behind that veil, right? And he ripped it. But then Jesus came on the scene. Now it's his spirit that has been moving. And that is now, we have a new way. The invitation now is for intimacy, for us to come into, from the Father, from Jesus and the Holy Spirit, to have intimacy with him, what? And to seek his face. Because now we get to have that as our blessing. The last idea I want to just talk about real quickly is continue, the word continually. If you look in Psalm 105, verse 4, it says continually. We now continually. What does the word continually mean? I think it means continually. It means constantly. It means there's nothing hindering us. It means unceasingly, constantly. You know, in our working, in our playing, in our struggles, in our joy, Anything we do, any time where we are, the very presence of of the Lord is where we have connection with him. Why? Because I can guarantee everyone that has called on the Lord and he's he's in your life. He is the the glory, um, Christ in you, the hope of glory resides in you. We have that personal connection, but it's a personal way for us to connect. And the last thing I want to say is our seeking his presence is a desire that we should seek no matter what. We can never have enough. We can never get enough. You know, we just have a deposit this side of heaven, right? But our desire should be, Lord, I want to be with you continually. I want to seek you no matter what, what you're, where, where I'm at, where you have me. So I want to ask you, how about you? My brothers and sisters, are you, are you reaching out to him constantly? Are you desiring with him? Are you satisfied with the prayer or song? Are you unsatisfied until you absolutely can make connection with him? But before I have you answer that, can I just share a couple? I want to answer that personally and just be open and share with you. (sighs) A couple watershed moments in my life where this issue of making really, making a personal connection with God where it was just the most utmost time for me. There's two times in my life that are watershed. One was right when, uh, I don't know, I lose track of dates because Trish and I are going to be married 29 years here coming in September, or uh, yeah, this month. And it's like there was a period when Trisha began this, um, this journey of inner healing. Um, and I'm not going to get into her story. I'm going to share about me here because this is what happened inside of me. You know, she's a survivor of SRA, occult, ritualistic abuse. She's been overcome so many things in her life. But there was a time when all this was coming to the surface of what had happened to her, where I was like really not, I had all these emotions, these feelings, I was having all these thoughts and everything, and I was just like, I was struggling. I was in a dark place, and I didn't really have anybody I could talk to. And so what was happening was I was angry at the Lord, because Lord, why? What in the heck is going on here? I don't get this. I don't understand. And I had this wrestling match, I was, and I was not willing to be honest with the Lord. And it was, what happened was, I would not, my anger at the Lord was being projected onto her. And I was not a very, very happy camper, and I was not nice and kind toward her. You know, it caused the fact where I didn't know how to honestly handle it. I would literally, I went into anger and fits of rage, and I would be directed at her, and it would hurt her. To the point where I remember one time we, had this, we, had, we were having this exchange. She was really walking through some difficult times and she just wanted somebody to, to just talk to and to lean on and to pray with and yet I was unavailable. To the point where I remember screaming one time and says, I, am, I didn't sign up for this. I was so angry. I left the home. I left, got in my truck and my truck, guys, is my place of my sanctuary. That's where I would always run to 
to say, Lord, I don't know what to do here. I got in my truck. I went down to this little park near my home called Meyer Park. And I just sat there and I was screaming at the Lord. I said, Lord, I did not sign up for this. I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. I don't want any part of this. I don't know how to handle this. And I said, I don't even know how to handle my own thoughts and feelings. And it got to the point where I literally was just yelling at the Lord. And I started to weep because I was like, Lord, I'm done. I just don't want to be this kind of person. And I mean, I stopped when I was doing that. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. The Lord should just send a lightning bolt right now. And I was just, for the first time in my life, I was being honest with him. I was being transparent. And I was just trying to have a conversation with him. And I felt like, well, I was waiting for the lightning bolt to come. But it never came. And you know what I was met with in that moment? I was met with this sweet voice, this is calm presence. And I, got, I had this peace that came over me. And I just heard the Lord gently say to me, Jeff, it's going to be okay. He said, I gave you to my wife, to Trisha. I gave, you, I gave you to her so that she could see the kind of man that loves me and that wants to have a relationship with me, what that actually looked like because she didn't have that growing up. That was like, boosh. And I just said, Lord, you could have struck me, but he didn't. And you know what? Did everything change overnight? No, but it taught me the importance of being transparent and wanting to connect with the Lord. The second time, Last one I want to share here, and then we'll bring this thing in for a landing, is the day I dropped Trisha off, you know, but just over, over little, not under two years ago, she was diagnosed with stage uh, 3B breast cancer. She had a double mastectomy. December 2nd, she went in for her surgery. And that was still, there were some still COVID restrictions in place in the hospital. And we went through all the protocol. And I was, again, I could feel all these things coming up in me. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And I was, just didn't know. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I, I started walking her down the hallway, taking her away, and I just kissed her and I said goodbye. And then I got in and I, I had to leave the hospital because we couldn't stay there during the, the surgery. There was a rule that we family couldn't stay. And I'm walking across the uh, walkway at Southdale Hospital, in, in, for those of you who know, up in Edina. And I went through that walkway. And as I started walking to that walkway, I just started to weep. And I started to cry because I'm thinking, Lord, am I ever going to see my wife again? And there was something happening inside of me where it's like, Jesus, I, I felt so out of control. I felt like I don't know what I can do. What, how am I supposed to be in this moment? And I literally sat down on the steps in a parking garage. And I started to weep and I started to just talk to the Lord and, and just cry out to him. And I said, Lord, right now... Yes, I'm asking you for healing. Yes, now I'm asking you to be here. I know you're here. But I said, more what I want more than anything, Jesus, I just want you. I want you to know that you're with me in this. And I sat down, and I'm sitting there, and I think there may have been two or three people that walked by me. I didn't care. And I started crying, and then looking, you know, again, peace came over me. There was a peace that I could not understand. It was the Holy Spirit coming. But there was a direct connection again. And I remember sitting there, I got up, and I walked and I went home, and I just went about my morning, and um, just by my normal day. But there was a way that the Lord kind of, he, he, he met me to be open, just to share your heart with him. So as we close, I want to just come and do two things, Okay. These are things that I've found that I want to just, we're going to do, there's always a practical application to this. But as a close today, this is kind of how we're going to end today. I want to share a couple things with you in terms of a practical application. I want to pray over you. I want to pray a prayer that I pray over myself and I pray over um, my family. I pray over my wife. I pray it over everyone. But how we're going to end is I'm going to do those two things and there's not going to be an official releasing of you today. What I want to do is we're going to have a time, an extended time here at the end. We're going to have the worship. Brian and Cheryl are going to come back up. So would you guys come back up? And what we're going to do is we're just going to allow you to come. We're going to have some worship. You can linger. We're going to minister unto the Lord. You can sit and you can just have some time. You can connect with Jesus. You can just, I want to give you that opportunity to come and sit with him and just be with him. But if you need prayer, there are, the, the, there are elders here that will pray for you. There are some members of the prayer team that will come pray with you. But I want to invite you that that's how we're going to do it. And if you do need to leave after I'm done praying over you, 
feel free. There's no, no shame. Just feel free. You can leave. You can just dismiss yourself. If you want to connect with people, that's fine. But I would ask that you take it out to the, uh, to the, to the common area. So it's just going to be, once I pray over you, feel free to go if you need to, or just stay. I want to invite you to stay and to linger. So there's two applications. One is real simple. It's called the one-minute pause. You know, we all have lives that we lead, right? And I do this a lot in my day. The one-minute pause is simply this. You just, if you're feeling something happening in your day, just stop. Pause. Just put down what you're doing. I go to my truck and I put it down. If I'm in the middle of I'm frustrated with something that's happened at work, I just stop. And then just go and just pause and then just breathe. And say, Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. One minute pause. I think it's something, guys, any of us can do. All of us. I'm not picking on the guys today, but it's one thing we can all do. Jesus, I give everyone and everything to you. And then I just simply, some things I maybe say, says, Jesus, I need more of you. Fill me with more of you. Restore my union. Fill me with your life. Because, guys, what we have is we have the Holy Spirit at our access to give us life. So this is what I want. And you can just bow your heads. This is about a three or four minute prayer. I'm going to pray this over you. And then I just want you to receive it. I'm going to pray it in the first person like I'm praying it for myself. But you receive this for yourself. Just let, let yourself just receive and just you can just repeat it in your mind if you need to. So let me pray. It's called the prayer of, of life. And this is all rooted in scripture. I love this prayer. Lord Jesus, you are my life. You have breathed into me the breath of life and I have become a living being. Genesis 2 verse 7. My very existence and my being flow from you. In you I live and move and have my being. Acts 17, 28. You are the vine. I am a true branch of yours. John 15, 5. Heavenly Father, you have made me alive with Christ. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 5. Jesus, you have become my second Adam. You are a life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. He came that I might have life and have it abundantly. John 10, 10. I have Jesus Christ and I have his life. John 5, verse 12. Christ is now my life. Colossians 3, verse 4. Dear Heavenly Father, I give my life to you to be filled with you. Restore this frail branch in full union with Jesus, who is the vine. Restore my full union with Christ and with you. I return and present myself to you. I give my body, my soul, my spirit, my heart, my mind, my will, my emotions. I return myself fully to you. You are the source of my life. May I be one with you even as Jesus was and is one with you. John 10, verse 30. John 17, verse 21. Let your life flow through me and flow and flow and flow throughout this day. O life, live into me, encompass me in all that I am, well up within me. O spring of life, let your river flow through my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength, my will, and my emotions. John 7, 38. You are the God who gives life to the dead, Romans 4, 17. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead... Romans 4, 17. From the dead is living in me, and you are living in me, Lord. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to my mortal body through the power of your Holy Spirit, who lives in me, Romans 8, verse 11. Oh, God, fill me with the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in my body, soul, and spirit. For it is Christ in me that is my hope of glory. Colossians 1 27. It is the triumphant life of Jesus Christ that has become my life. I live by him. I reign in life through him by the life of Christ Jesus in me. For if when I was your enemy, I was reconciled to you through the death of your son, how much more having been reconciled shall I be saved through his life? Romans 5 10. 
I announce, declare, and decree that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I consecrate my life fully to you, Lord Jesus, to be a vessel of your triumphant life. I now claim the resurrection of triumph in Jesus Christ and the power of his empty tomb, the power of the river of life against all forms of death and destruction that may come against me. By Jesus Christ and his great work, I cut off every attempt of my enemies to steal, kill, or destroy my life. As Jesus said, no one takes my life from me, John 10, 18, and death has no mastery over me, for I am united with Christ, and I am one spirit with him, 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I am in Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30, and Christ is in me, Colossians 1, 27. I claim the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus now, the power of the river of life that flows from the very throne of heaven against every black law of sin and death, against every foul power of destruction that may may be aimed against me. And by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bind and banish all forms of bondage and death from me right now. All spirits, all witchcraft, all foul powers. I cancel all claims against me by the work of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 13 to 15. And I claim the resurrection of Christ against me, my enemies and their devices, and I bind them from me, and I send them to the feet of the true Lord Jesus Christ to be dealt with by him. I pray and ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus and his everlasting glory. So now I take my place in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in his life, for I have been raised with Christ to a new life present my life to Jesus to be filled with your life. I choose to live by the strength of Jesus Christ and by his mighty life. I ask all of this Heavenly Father over myself and over every one of my brothers and sisters here in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Like I said, feel free to linger. Feel free to stay. You can come forward if you'd like. You can uh, come for prayer, but if you need, to, if you feel you need to be dismissed, you feel free to go. So, blessings.